on the 102nd birthday of Phyllis Crystal and her story of her life with Sai Baba. So he came, I watched, and then passed me on the women's side. And I thought, oh, but then he's not my master. As soon as I thought that, he whirled around, looked straight through me, I knew he knew everything about me, and said such a strange thing. So, you have come. I thought, well, yes, it's obvious I've come. <laughs> At last. And I remember one interview um, where he um, danced into the room. Uh, Baba John, danced into the room? Yes, just, <laughs> just wafted in. He looked around and smiled at all of us and said, you don't know who you are. None of you knows who you are. I was in the back of the room. I was always hiding in the back because I was extremely shy. <laughs> and Mrs. Crystal, say I am God. I shrank. It was sacrilege, absolutely. <laughs> and I couldn't do it. Mrs. Crystal, say I am love, God. I said, Baba, I can't. Mrs. Crystal, say I am God. Finally, I thought, oh, I've got to get out of this. So just to get it over with, I said, I'm God. <laughs> no, no, no. That was not enough for him. Louder. Finally, I was shrieking it just to get it over with. So this is his message. What, what I like to help people do is to reprogram some of the old still painful memories and cut the ties to them that he wanted the method that, I, uh, that Virginia and I had brought forth to reach as many people in the world as possible. But he also stressed strongly that I must work with youth, that youth. they are the ones who would take the world to the new age. Mm. That's all I'm interested in is being his instrument. She lives these days in Surrey, south of London, at 102 Phyllis Crystal, mystic, author, teacher, and since 1972, follower of Sri Satya Sai Baba. And she's still publishing and working with people individually, in person, by phone, and by Skype. Welcome to Soul Journeys. This interview was recorded in Phyllis Crystal's home in Guildford, England, several days before her birthday on May 11, 2016. Phyllis, Happy 102nd birthday. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> You've got the love of the world focused in your direction. People who don't even know you except by name and reputation love you, and they're wishing you a happy 102nd birthday. Yeah. And I am too. I'd, love to, I'd like to thank everybody for so much love. It overwhelms me. I wonder what on earth I've done to deserve that. You've been a good girl. <laughs> <laughs> you were interested in sharing with Jody and me when you called us about a month ago, maybe two months ago, with some good news. You said you had emerged from the dark night of the soul. And I was shocked that at your age, that was a sensation that could still be felt. I thought you were already so far advanced that you would never oh, go no, through no, that. no, no, no. <laughs> Do you mind talking about that? No, no, no. It's, uh, for, it's um, about, it's what my new book is about. Uh, I, I think I've got, called it The Flight of the Phoenix to... Um, and it's coming out on your birthday, real soon. Hopefully. And uh, it's the story of the phoenix, mm -hmm. but it's also the story of the butterfly, which starts as, a, as a, an egg and then a caterpillar, and then the caterpillar moves into the chrysalis, and I think that the chrysalis stage of the caterpillar is similar to what the old saints used to call the dark night of the soul or the cloud of unknowing. Yes, Thomas Burton referred to it that way. Because in our lives, especially in mine, it's been nonstop working, working, like eating, eating, yes. active. And then there comes a time when you have, apparently, when you have to withdraw and uh, go into what I call the chrysalis stage. And I think that's what's 
what I've been going through. And it is dark because it's enclosed. You're, you're very much inside of your own soul. And you see I'm here with nothing to do. And uh, so I've got a lot of time to concentrate on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do, it's, not, it's not easy. Not one bit. I don't recommend it, but we all have to go through whatever we have to go through. We have no clue. What helped you to come through it? <clears throat> um, I'm still going through it. Are you? <laughs> Just keeping in touch with my, my um, uh, Swami within, because he, he was very, very stern with me that I also my real self, my high C, was, it was similar to Swami, that we've all got that aspect. If you want to call it your soul or your spirit, doesn't matter what you call it. Mm -hmm. we, call, we always called it high C for higher consciousness. Mm -hmm. and so I think that's the goal for all of us eventually, maybe not in this lifetime, but it's certainly come to, to me in this lifetime. And it's, and coming, and it's coming to others. I, I, I regret that I can't say it's come to me yet, but because we do this work of interviewing so many people, really around the world, Jody and I have discovered that we occasionally, rarely, but occasionally, find people who have had this revelation in their lives. You might call it an awakening. Oh, yes. You might call it realization where they come into contact and awareness of their true self, their true high C. Yes, we're not limited to just our conscious self and our everyday routine. There is another aspect which a lot of people are not aware of at all. I personally find it's it... It's not necessarily religion. See, I'm not quite sure I have a loss for words. We're not talking about religion or spirituality per se. But your true self has to be identified somehow. How would you best identify it? Well, it's not tangible, your, yourself, but it's who you really are. And presumably, if you believe in, uh, in karma and past lives, it's the part of you, the real part, that incarnates in this life. And then when it dies out of that life, it will come back at, at, at a later time in another one. And some people are able to recall their past lives. I've been um, given the gift of, of uh, being shown some of my own, and it made, they made elegant sense of what, uh, what I've been undergoing in this life. Really? And uh, I don't think it's necessary just to believe that you that you are now working out things which to, you didn't have a chance to do before. And uh, it's in a way it's a gift, and in a way I would say it's um, the opposite. <laughs> well, there's it can only, be very painful. Well, I'm sure it is for a spell until you come through it more clearly. Uh, and one of the questions that I have is not everybody can come rapping on your door here in Surrey. Not everybody can email you or telephone you. So for those of us who are living busy lives and have little access to somebody of your understanding, what, what would you advise people to do for themselves to help them further their path towards self-discovery, true well, self-discovery? Well, in the first place, I think it's very important to try to live Baba's teachings, especially unconditional love and selfless service. Those are the two main ones that he left as a heritage for us after he um, moved on from this active life in the world. And uh, if we can just follow those two, it's, it can uh, help us along our own path. And I imagine a big part of what you just said is not only unconditional love of your neighbor, but self-unconditional love as well. Absolutely. People. That was the hardest one for me. And I remember one interview um, where he um, danced into the room. Uh, <laughs> Baba danced into the room? Yes, just, <laughs> just 
wafted in. He, he looked, sometimes he looked like he didn't have his feet on the ground. He just wafted in, looked around and smiled at all of us and said, you don't know who you are. None of you knows who you are. And we all looked at one another and we thought, well, we thought we did. We thought we knew who the other person was too. Some of them were familiar to us. And then he turned uh, and looked around the room and he caught sight of me and I thought, oh my God, what's coming this time? So then he turned around and he said, I was in the back of the room. I was always hiding in the back because I was extremely shy. <laughs> and Mrs. Crystal, say I am God. I shrank. I'd been brought up here in England, in the Church of England, and also by a very strict mother. And to say those it's blasphemy. words... blasphemy. It's heresy to say that as a strict Christian. It was sacrilege, absolutely. <laughs> and I couldn't do it. <laughs> Even though he was commanding you to say it. Mrs. Crystal, say I am love, God. I said, Baba, I can't. Mrs. Crystal, say I am God. Finally, I thought, oh, I've got to get out of this somehow or other. I can't go on afternoon or, you know, or, or, or hours at a time just objecting or refusing. So just to get it over with, I said, I'm God. <laughs> no, no, no. That was not enough for him. It's louder. So I was saying it louder. And finally, I was shrieking it just to get it over with. So this is his message. I didn't know he was so forceful teaching people that. I didn't know he was so forceful. Oh my God, yes. He could be really forceful, very forceful. So you saw many dimensions of Sai Baba, the loving father, mother oh, figure, yes. and the stern yes. teacher. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And the, and the, the lighthearted Baba dancing into the room. Yes, and the teasing, loving, um, person to person's uh, experience. See, many of us have missed that with Baba. It was utterly, utterly unexpected. I never would have dreamed it because I didn't have a very um, high opinion of my value or myself. Um, and I thought, well, I, it, it took a long time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then, but he would not let me, let me go. So after you he shouted persevered it. persevered and persevered and persevered. Mm -hmm. After you said it, after you whispered it and then shouted it and mm -hmm. complied with his request, did that start to make sense for you? Because I think many of us still have that difficulty today. How dare you suggest that you are God? Do you know what you're saying? Well, of course, you have to add his other teaching. You are not the physical body. The physical body is like a temple. And he came in another time in an interview. You are all walking temples. And I thought that was a beautiful way of expressing it. Walking temples. Walking temples. In other words, the body is the temple and you are, with the help of the body, moving through life as a, the inhabitant of that temple. So that's your reality. That's who we really are. So we're, the, the temple is just the, the construct that holds the real Phyllis crystal. But what is, what is the real Phyllis crystal? What is your, your, your Atma self? What is your higher sea? You've used certain words to describe it, but many of us still don't understand as clearly as we need to. Um. No, because we've been brought up in the world with the, with the world um, philosophy or lack of it or uh, teaching. A, a worldly philosophy, yes. Yes, that we must take care of the body. Mm -hmm. And yes, we do have to take care of the body. And the mind, as, and, and the and heart. And the mind, just you take care of your house. You live in your house, you keep it clean and you... Um, you keep it in good, good uh, state, and so we do have to be very careful, and uh, and and practice, of course, what 
try to practice what Baba teaches. But he's not the only teacher that's taught this, because I had followed a lot of the old teachers in my life. Uh, but he was by far the most, um, I would say, how uh, he was the, the, the firmest, the, the strictest teacher ever. But he could be, of course, extremely loving. Hmm. He, he insisted it had to be unconditional love. So anyway, here he was coming out from his from his um, the gates that led to his house, and I watched. And he would he would hardly have his feet on the ground. It's almost like he was floating <laughs> from the one side of the of the, the men's side to the ladies' side to the men's side to the ladies' side. And I thought to myself, well, I know that the master has to change, uh, has to uh, recognize the chela, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So I would not make myself conspicuous. So he came, I watched, and I was fascinated because he hardly had his feet on the ground. <coughs> He went to the men's side, came back to the women's side, the men's side, and then passed me on the women's side. Passed you? Yes. Didn't look at you? No. <clears throat> and I thought, oh, well then he's not my master. As soon as I thought that, he whirled around physically, the whole, his whole body, faced me looked straight through me, I knew he knew everything about me, and said such a strange thing. So, then a long pause, when he was just piercing me with his eyes. You have come. I thought, well, yes, it's obvious I've come. Because <laughs> that was my busy monkey mind. And then after that long pause, at last, <laughs> as much as to say, what took you so long? You know, that was, the in, that was what the underlying question was. Why did you take so long, in other words? And I thought to myself, well, we came as soon as we heard about you. We, uh, I only had a book fall on me about you in a, li in a, um, um, a bookstore one time. And that's how you initially found out about Sai And that's Baba. how I knew that you were here in the world, and I thought I knew all of the the ancient masters and had followed their teachings, never seen you before. How could I possibly have come here? I, I really begged my husband that the next time we went to India, we would come and see you. But this was all going like this in my mind. So he, he left me with all those, those questions. And then, said, come for an interview tomorrow morning at nine o'clock and bring the band. And I looked around at all the ladies around and I thought, where on earth could I get a band? People who play music, you know, that a was musical what, band. That's what I thought. <laughs> what did he mean? And then the ladies around me were all giggling because they could see my dilemma and they said, husband. <laughs> or he said, husband, that's right. And so it was, it started with joking because I was always so terribly serious and he wouldn't let us be dead serious. We had to take life lightly. So that's how the first thing happened. Good. Do you remember what year this may have been? I never remember dates. In the 70s, 60s? Probably around 72, I suppose. Okay. I'm guessing. Yeah. So these are back in the days when only a handful of people would yes. show up to see Sai Baba in yes. India. Yes, and of Westerners, they were mostly young people. And Sidney must have loved you so much that even though he didn't think he was going to see Sai Baba, he wanted to take you to see Sai Baba. Yes, and I think he... Um, According to who he was and the way he we, he reacted, uh, he wanted to have this experience. 
Mm -hmm. And why do you suppose it was that mostly Westerners were there and not fellow Indians, either from Andhra Pradesh or Delhi or Bangalore or Hyderabad? Why do you suppose mostly Westerns came to him back in those days? Oh, it wasn't mostly Westerners. Oh, I thought you said mostly Westerners were there. No, it, it was very, very few Westerners. Just a few young people. I see. I misunderstood you. There were uh, one or two that went earlier. I think Elsie Cowan went earlier in maybe 68 or something. I'm guessing again. Mm -hmm. But very few people. Did the we were some of the first ones. Did the, did the people who were not Westerners think it was unusual that you would come? That, that people Oh, no, they were used to me. They were, okay. Yes. Yeah. They knew I wasn't the traditional woman. I'm going to ask you to put your thinking cap on for one more Baba story because they're so wonderful. Um, I know the story of when you, if I have it under, if I understand it correctly, because Jody and I had the great pleasure to visit you in Munich, oh. in München, oh, and, yeah. and we were there, and you were happy, and you had lived in Ojai, California before that. You grew up here in Surrey, in England, and Baba invited you to come to talk, but instead of giving a talk, if I have the story correct, you went up to him and he said, move to Switzerland. And it was a real puzzle to you because you didn't know why you, you didn't know why Baba told you to move to Switzerland. Do I have that right? Yes, he... Did you he ever made, figure out why? He made quite a point of it. Did you ever figure out why? No. No. Why do, you, why do you suppose he wanted you to move to Switzerland? Well, I suppose he wanted to start the process of me being willing to do what he told me to get the work, the method, mm -hmm. to as many people in the world as possible. Because that's what he was insisting on. That's why he wanted me to write the books. And so you did. You would and go around the world. every book. You came to our home, and we had satsangs outside with a hundred people hearing about your work in Cleveland, Ohio, because that's what you were wanting to do. I remember picking you up at the airport. Oh, yes. And I, I expected Phyllis Crystal and her entourage to come off the airplane. But there was no entourage. No. It was just Phyllis Crystal. And I was so impressed with your dedication to follow through on this work that Baba had charged you with. Share this work with young people. Share it with other people. Well, it's been an honor, and uh, it has given me great satisfaction that I could give something to the world. Because when you look around at the world, it's seemingly so negative in this Kali Yuga and to be able to offset it or balance it a little bit was a big privilege. So you're 102 in a few days. You have a brand new book. Tell us a little bit more about this book and tell us about the next book you're going to write. Oh, I hope this is the last one. I don't think I can go on any longer. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> So what well, about this book? This one is the call, being called The Flight of the Phoenix mm -hmm. to, initi to um, in, uh, Liberation. And also an undertitle, The Journey of the um, um, Butterfly. Wonderful. Because the butterfly starts as the egg and hatches into the um, caterpillar. The caterpillar withdraws into the chrysalis, and then out of the chrysalis comes the butterfly. The very stages and you is, yourself have been through. And this is the journey we are all on, whether we know it or not. And uh, it's it's um, it's very it's apparent what's been happening in my life, because I feel that moving here and then get having the um, accident so that I, mm -hmm. I'm really a prisoner has, has forced me to withdraw from life and go into the chrysalis stage where, what, where the transformation that will um, take place between the uh, very, very active, very, very 
um, um, well active mm -hmm. uh, like I, life I had lived um, as the uh, caterpillar uh, withdraw into the um, chrysalis where I'm alone a lot and having to go inside and it's not that everybody has to do it the way I've been shown to do it, but we all are on this path and we might just as well understand it because we will definitely at some point have to go through what some of the saints called the dark night of the soul or the cloud of unknowing or, oh there's another one, Bunyan I think is uh, the um, Oh, what does he call it? Um, well, I've forgotten. But those two descriptive titles yes. say it all. They do. The cloud of unknowing, yes. the dark side of the yes. soul. Hence, that and was... they were un uh, Evelyn Underhill. Hence, that was the purpose of your phone call to us that resulted in this opportunity to sit down and talk to you on Soul Journeys about Phyllis Crystal's own dark night of the soul experience. Mm -hmm. And you know, of course, when somebody like me hears that, there's two feelings that come to me. And the first one's depression. It's very depressing to think that all of us must endure this transformation. It's sad, it's painful, it's lonely, it's depressing, and yes, it I don't is. want to do it. However, what you're also saying is, Ted has no choice. I don't especially want to do it either. <laughs> <laughs> None of us has a choice, is no, what you're saying. that we have no choice. And we might as well, if not welcome it with open arms, adjust our outlook to understand that we yes. must go through this period. And then look at the periods when we're depressed or we've lost somebody or we're, we're sad as necessary in our journey. And it's not easy. I don't, I don't want to pretend, mm -hmm. I don't want to paint it as a beautiful picture. It's not easy, but it's essential. Well, maybe yes. that's why, I, uh, this hasn't always been my feeling, but it's been my feeling recently that the older I get, the more I follow Baba and his teachings, the more I wish to look inward to discover the high sea in myself, just as a generalization. Mm-hmm the more difficult life seems to become for me, oh, yes. both in frequency and in intensity. Yes. And I always expected it would be the opposite. Nobody ever told me that. No, before. nobody ever told me either. Why would anybody sign up for Except this? Except you can <laughs> read uh, the uh, writings of some of the older masters and teachers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I never really thought about following any of them. It just, I was able to liken it with other people suggesting what was going on to me. I didn't want to hear it, but, but it's happening and I, I, it has to happen to all of us eventually. Well, Phyllis, I think maybe the best way I can think of to end this wonderful birthday discussion with you is to thank you for being, you talked about the older teachers, the older teachings. You are giving us in person the older teaching from yourself, from your awareness of the pain that you've been put through, that is a boon. It's a great word that I hear lots of Indians use. It, the greatest boon I can think of is what you've just given us, the awareness to expect, to embrace, and to follow through to its logical conclusion, this transformation that you speak of so passionately. Wait. When did that first become real for you, that that's your gift? Well, actually, I suppose long before I knew about Swami, because when I was working with my friend Virginia, we um, were having lunch one day, and we were talking about our lives. We, we both had husbands. Uh, she had a daughter and a son. I had two daughters. and. Uh, we were perfectly okay with that, but we felt there was something missing. And so um, we'd had dreams where things, well, I suppose particularly when there was a question or a problem in our life, we found that even though we wouldn't be able to figure it out on the conscious level, we might have a dream to show us an answer. So we figured there must be something 
besides our conscious mind that would that knew everything and uh, so we were very interested in trying to get in t touch with whatever this is and we called it the high sea for high consciousness that's, so that's the origin of the high sea that was the heart the orig origin mm -hmm. but where did that initial awareness come from most of us go through the majority of years of our lives and never come to that understanding i know many many people have asked with me that question and I really don't know, except I think I knew, even as a small child, that there was more to me than this little girl running mm -hmm. around in a body. Often people will... Because my um, grandmother, grandfather on my mother's side, uh, before he, he died, which I didn't know was going to happen, I was taken to see him and lifted up onto his bed because he, had, he had, was bedridden. He'd broken his leg and that meant death mm -hmm. in those days. There was nothing you could do about it. Just breaking your leg meant death. Oh yes, there was no, nothing that they could do, not way back then. This was in the late 50s. And uh, so um, I didn't know he was going to die. I, I just knew that this was my uh, grandfather, my mother's father. And uh, he called me uh, Phil, you know, they all mm -hmm. called me Phil. And he said, you are, uh, uh, how did he put it now, let me remember. Um, you carry the Fay quality for the family. And what he meant was I, that on his side, it was Irish. And so I had the inheritance of the Fay quality that the Irish ca carry which means the mystical, and they they know they know they communicate with spirits. So, so they saw that in you. He saw that in me, and I thought he meant that I could see the fairy folk, which I could, but I thought everybody did, and found out later, of course, that that was not the case. So uh, I think that probably I had this aspect of myself quite clear as a little girl and uh, it's I, I, it's just been active I suppose ever since. And I know you still have that gift because you keep telling me to tell others that you're still doing your work and that you're able to help people no matter what the age is uh, over the telephone or in person. Yes, well I would say a general uh, what practice is to go uh, is to go back in memory with them to their childhood, because all of the problems, that, not all, but many, many, many of the problems that we have in adulthood stem from what went on while we were children. And the memory is still there in the, in the subconscious level. And so I try to get them connected to the subconscious or, and, or the, what we call the high C, the higher consciousness, and uh, resolve with the use of my methods, which in, involves some symbols, because the language of the subconscious mind is symbolic, it's pictorial. And so when we send a message via a symbol, it carries a certain um, importance for the person. So you're telling me, I'm 70 years old, I could go back 65, 67 years to the experiences I had as a small child and oh, yes. derive meaningful understanding? Oh, yes. mm -hmm. But I can't imagine that I retain these memories from so many decades ago. You don't retain them, all, all of them, uh, clearly uh, with your conscious mind because the conscious mind is scattered mm -hmm. and it's busy all the time with just living, breathing, eating, <laughs> moving, working, whatever. Uh -huh. But um, you can make contact with it. And what, what I like to help people do is to reprogram some of the old still painful memories and cut the ties to them 
and there's a there's a, a, a specific method, the, that which is what I teach, of being able to go back and uh, retrieve or re um, reprogram uh, certain aspects, particularly if um, if like me and many 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 others, um, you've been brought up to believe that you're um, not important or that you're incapable or you're stupid. So many people have been tell me that they have been programmed that they're stupid and it's one of the cruelest things you can do. Mm -hmm. I, I can well see how that's true. Mm -hmm. And you had this gift early on in your life as you explained with your friend to be able to dig deeply into your background, into your memory and ferret out some of these issues perhaps that happened to you and see that you weren't responsible for them. They're not an accurate characterization of who you are and you grew in a positive way from that. I, and, and, and you were able to help yourself understand yourself better. Yes. <clears throat> now this all came before you knew or, of Sai Baba. Never heard of him and I had really made an effort to search out the teachings of some of the holy men in the world, either dead or alive, but I had never heard of, of Sai Baba. When you did finally come to hear of Sai Baba, <coughs> how did you treat this gift you already have of being able to help people? Was he able to either bless you, affirm for you, or help you advance your understanding of this? work you were already involved with? He would always make sure that I, uh, I, uh, I knew that he knew. And one of his most common messages to me was, well the first one was that he wanted the method that, I, uh, that Virginia and I had brought forth to reach as many people in the world as possible. But he also stressed strongly that I must work with youth, that youth. they are the ones who would take the world to the new age. And so I've been trying to do that ever since, because Bob has made, stressed it over and over and over. They are the ones who would take us to the new age. You and were talking to a gentleman before I turned the camera on, and you were talking about an encounter with Baba, and he mouthed the word youth to you over yes. and over again. If I was, uh, if he, uh, if I was in Dasha mm -hmm. and uh, he was wandering around, it didn't matter where he was, he didn't have to be close to me, he would catch my eye and then mouth it, work with youth, work with youth. Mrs. Crystal, work with youth. And, and then when he came closer to me, he would actually say it to me in a normal way. Mm -hmm. But the he youth, made a big point of it. He said, they're the only ones that can take uh, the world to the new age. And after the age of, um, well, when, when adulthood, uh, uh, whenever they become adults, then they lose the openness or mm -hmm. the, um, the ability to make these, these changes. But they need to get together. And then, of course, as he said, he told me many times that he wanted the, my work to reach as many people in the world as possible. And that's why I've been willing, even though I am uh, infirmed in a lot of ways, I'm still willing to um, teach or talk or, or demonstrate um, his, uh, his teachings. And you work with the, the youth even today, and my question to you is, I don't know of too many adults who are able to relate to the lives of the youth today. The young people I know relate only to the, their fellow young people. From where do you get this gift to connect with the young people and to have an impact on their lives? Well, um, there is a young, uh, a young people's group that comes to see me about every three or four weeks. Really? And uh, they are all young professionals. 
and so they also teach the work to uh, to other people. So it it gradually uh, gets to more and more people in the world, which is what he wants. So I think that's why I've been, that the only reason I've been uh, um, I've been willing to um, give all the teachings, the seminars, the teaching courses. Um, it's, it's my, I suppose, my last um, activity, so that what I've been shown uh, through Barbara and through the work that I started all those years ago, um, those who feel drawn to this inner path uh, will be shown a few of the steps. They're not exactly the same, but they're similar for different people. And if I can make it easier, or if my books can give, can give them a little bit more of an insight, then I'm very grateful that I was given the opportunity to share it. Wonderful. From the bottom and of my I heart, thank, thank you. And I thank from the bottom of my heart for enabling me to be his instrument because it's the only wish I have. And I hope that I don't have to give up that wish. <laughs> I don't think so. Because he does say give up your desires. Yeah, but there's oh, a difference that. between a wish and a desire. And I was very aware of what that program meant because he gave me a whole interview on the ceiling on desires. Did he? And what it meant, yes. And I wrote a, a, a book about it. Well, you know we're addicted to our desires. And he says there's only one addiction he says is permissible. And that's the addiction to God. That's it. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and so... If I can share it with, I, I don't ever want to push it. It's not my, I know that's not the right way. I can hand it to people, but it's up to the people themselves to take it. And I am encouraged that a lot of the young people nowadays are really lost. And so I hope that I can reach more younger people as he insisted that I do, so that they can carry this and carry the world to the new age, which is what he, pro pro what he predicted. Well, you're doing this right now. May this <laughs> video serve this purpose to be shared with many people. With your help, Ted, and well, your, your soldier, soldiers are so important. Well, you're, you're awfully kind. I just want to conclude this saying from the bottom of my heart, my love for you and for Baba, and for Jody for bringing me to both of you. Thank I'm you very much. I'm so sad that Jody's not here. But Jody, if you're listening, I want to give you a big hug and just tell you how much I love you and how sorry I am not to see you this time. But I hope next time you'll be able to come too. She'll be so happy. And I, <laughs> thank you so much. You're God so love welcome. you. Sairam, Sairam, Sairam. Sairam, Sairam.